Hi, it's Dr. Noel Williams, Optimal Health Associates, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Uh, June 12th, this probably won't be posted for a few days. Uh, COVID review. We've learned a lot about COVID. I've spent, I don't know how many thousands of hours reading about COVID. And so what are, have we settled out on? Since I still see people for long haul and you, you have some interesting stuff going on that's all tragic with um, elevations in death rates and actuarial tables for people who are supposedly very healthy um, across all the major life insurance companies. Uh, and they're doing an evaluation of that. What caused long haul? What's, what's all this, what happened? And what's the latest data on some of the things we did? Because you can't, in science, which we don't, which we don't do, we don't follow the science in the United States. I want to be very clear about that. We've not followed it for the last three years, and we're not going to probably follow it ever again. But that's why I have to post periodically because I'm going to give you the other side of what the science shows. Um, but the science with COVID is what actually happened in the cell is the COVID viral particle would get into cells and it could get into any type of cell and do this. And it would affect what I have talked about before, mitochondrial function. And it caused toxicity in the mitochondria, which damaged the mitochondria. It could also do that in the nucleus. But once you get mitochondrial dysfunction, the cell isn't making energy packets. And once it's not making energy packets, there's problems with cell function, or in other words, there's dysfunction. And collaterally, when the mitochondria is getting damaged and when the viral replication is occurring there, and, and some are called the endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria gets leaky and it leaks out its own little segments of DNA, because mitochondria have their own segments of DNA. And that DNA causes inflammation or the release of inflammasomes and cytokines within the cell cytoplasm, which causes further damage to the cell and eventually cell death. And then those, proce those products, when the cell um, falls apart or lysis becomes lysed, um, then cause more inflammation. So again, it's about the mitochondria. And you look at oxygen utilization, all this stuff, mitochondrial injury is what was important in the beginning to know, but we took time. And then number two, it's what we've been needing to address with um, long haul because it's long-term mitochondrial injury. Because mitochondria need a bunch of stuff to work. They need oxygen, they need niacin, but they need free T3 or uh, liothyronine, the T3, the thyroid hormone. It works in the middle of the mitochondria. If it's a bean, it's in the middle of the bean. Um, it needs testosterone, it needs B vitamins, it needs lipoic acid, it needs methylated folic acid, it needs a ton of nutrients, zinc, iodine. And once you have all those things, that is going to make the mitochondria work. But once it's damaged, how do you fix it? And so that's been the challenge and there's still research ongoing, but I think, I think the way you fix mitochondria is pretty straightforward. And our experience is, you think about one, a super potent multivitamin, and there's, there's of course, ones that are better than others. Um, but again, super potent multivitamin, appropriate nutrition, NAD, nicotinide, adenide dinucleotide infusions, and then we are, and amino acids and things like that. But then we also think very, very strongly about ozonation uh, therapy, which is when you take blood and you um, put ozone in it and you reinfuse it in and or infuse it in, sorry. And so, and I've talked about that before, but we'll talk more about ozone in the future. And that really seems to have some positive restorative effects in terms of how people do. We've done it, I mean, hundreds of times uh, successfully, but the bottom line is it's all part of a collateral healthcare plan for people, which can improve how they feel. So that's one thing to be aware of. Now, the second thing to be aware of, there the Cochrane reviews, which I've talked about many times, which is like pretty much a definitive review of the entire current science on a subject, have looked at what are mitigation strategies. And I always told people, mitigation strategies have one purpose, give you, you know, six, 12, 18 weeks, some short period of time to potentially slow the viral spread down while you came up with a management plan. And mitigation strategies don't work as a therapy. 
and we utilize them as a therapy. And if anyone who's gonna criticize me for saying that, go ahead and criticize me because I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> it's that simple. Read a freaking infectious disease prevention article before you get on my Facebook page and bitch at me, okay? I'm sick of it. I'm sick of people who know nothing complaining about strategies for preventive medicine stuff who have no training. So read about it and understand it. That's what they're for. But we use it as a active strategy. Well, the data is out from the Cochrane Review. Know how much masks and social distancy did? And they should say, well, this isn't the strongest data, but we've reviewed all the data and our gestalt is there's biases and stuff. But basically there is no mitigation strategy long-term for a respiratory viral infection. There was no impact. There was no social distancing impact. The only thing which they didn't address that but it's been shown that can be helpful is increasing the circulation from your HVAC units. That's why planes had very low transmission rates. Masks did not work. Social distancing did not work. It's pretty definitive now in terms of looking at all the data. And you can hem and haw about it, but it's micron size, folks. It's how big is the viral particle. It was less, it was got down to less than a micron. N95, and this Cochrane review looked at N95 masks. They looked at the whole thing. It didn't work because the micron, the micron size in the mass is bigger than the size of the particle. I'm always gonna say it's like trying to stop a gnat with a chain link fence. You can get emotional, good feelings by wearing it, but it's time to let go of emotion and try to be a science oriented society again. So mass didn't work. Okay, it was a good mitigation strategy. I was all for it, didn't work. Um, and neither did social distancing, but everybody knew that. Just like, cleaning thing, we, they at least retracted to cleaning the countertops off because that didn't work. So again, that was that subject. Uh, the lab leak theory, um, I think, which we've all seen now, where we don't know for sure it was a lab leak theory, we do know that the following, that uh, Fauci corrected everyone who said there was one privately, immediately, then wrote the letter saying there was no such thing as a lab leak theory, and had other authors sign off on it, both of which the two premier ones got multi-million dollar grants from his division shortly thereafter. Um, we know they definitely funded gain of function research. Um, and so when you add it all up, probably pretty likely, um, but are the Chinese ever gonna admit that? And I mean, not the Chinese people, the Chinese government to be clear, but of course not. How, how, how could you admit you caused this? I mean, it would be silly and unreasonable, just like the people in our NIH don't want to admit they funded it, but they did, and that they did everything they could to block it. But again, that's what the data shows. I'm sorry, but it is what it is. So I can't really think of anything else on COVID. Oh, it's going to be here. I'm going to discourage, okay, life table analysis. Uh, there's some correlation that COVID had a role or the vaccine did, but we're looking at multiple hundred of percent increases in death rates in people who had life insurance uh, and that data will come out more definitively but that's preliminary data um, and so something happened with COVID either the infection the vaccine or the combination they're in again I've talked about exosomes and how they work and it makes perfect sense that there would be an inflammatory reaction um, from both COVID and the COVID vaccine that may have been harmful uh, but again we didn't know that then or at least I didn't know that then I was concerned about it. I'm concerned that the FDA knew about it and didn't care or hid the data, but that's a whole separate issue of whistleblower complaints, so we'll see. And then that's really about it. I mean, I wouldn't encourage anyone to to get the vaccine at this point. Um, it's You can follow the recommendations, that's not, and we're allowed to have different opinions. There's no true data showing it's safe in low-risk populations or it has an impact in children or that is it is it really safe in pregnancy i don't know that i don't think that answers that has ever been answered um i mean the american college of OBGYN feels that it's safe but i and again they don't have perspective data and that was the big thing with all questions about therapy if there wasn't perspective data you couldn't believe anything if it was retrospective or open label trials none of that counted for anything that worked for covid whereas it worked for the vaccine on the other hand they don't do any of that and they say it works, but that's okay. And that's just observational. Again, American College of OBGYN and all, every major umbrella 
umbrella medical organization um, encourages further vaccination, you can make that choice. You can talk to your primary care doctor um, about it or whoever your healthcare expert is. Uh, and that's kind of the COVID summary. I'm not really all that worried about COVID. Take your vitamins and you're fine. Thanks.